Welcome to our second part of the Psychoacoustics course in the TO9 MOOC on auditory masking. This time we are considering the masking by tones, other tones, and temporal masking effects. We've already seen that the masking of a narrow band of noise is specific and more, uh, more strongly close to the center frequency of the noise. Similar effects occur when a tone is a masker and it's masking another tone. See here the masking pattern for a tone of low level where we slowly increase the level of the masker. And you see that the masking pattern changes. The masking pattern is most strongly, masking itself is most strongly near the center frequency of the tone and it decays towards higher and lower frequencies. However, at high levels and higher frequencies, masking is more pronounced, is more strong than at low frequencies. And you see that there is a strong excess of masking. If you increase the masker level, then masking increases more than proportionally. Each individual curve here stems from a masker level that's 10 dB above the other masker. But what you can see here is that masking itself here at 1500 Hz increases almost 20 decibels if you increase the masker level of only 10 dB. That means, in other words, masking is overly proportional and we cause this the upward spread of masking. So for high masker levels, one can mask sounds at far away frequencies, uh, even very pronouncedly. It can even be that the maximum of masking is not at this frequency of the masker, but at a higher frequency. The simultaneous masking of tones by tones is also more complicated than by noises, because different tones will change audibility and give rise to some changes in the pattern here, which at least at those levels that were used here are not yet too pronounced. If we now use the masking patterns of tones and go one step further and consider complex tones, which are the fundament for most sounds that we have in our environment, then we come and see a masking pattern like this. We can compose a complex tone with its fundamental frequency and multiple harmonics, which are twice, three, and so on, n times the fundamental frequency, we can compose the masking patterns as the sum of the individual masking patterns for each tone in the complex tone. What you see here is the masking pattern for the complex tone, but see it as a sum of the masking patterns that come here from the individual contributors. If I draw it like this, you also see that in this region here, there is a bit more masking. You cannot listen into the spectral gap as well as <clears throat> if you would consider it from the individual masking patterns. So there's a bit more masking in those uh, valleys. But overall, particularly at low levels, and particularly at low frequencies, where the spacing of the tone complexes is relatively large compared to the critical bands, we see that the masking is really determined by individual components and with individual peaks and the ability to listen for signals in between those uh, frequencies that make up the complex tone. So this brings us already a good step forward towards reality because many natural sounds are made of complex tones. Think just about speech, which has uh, harmonic complexes in there in the vowels. Now, so far, we considered masking only as a simultaneous masking exercise where stimuli are long enough so that we have kind of steady state conditions. But what happens if our stimuli are shorter, like it often is in the real world. Now let's first consider this case where we have a masker that's 
ongoing, it's a long-term mask, but we shorten the tone. So we just have a short tone bib in that mask. And uh, the results for this are given in this curve here. We see the level of the tone burst, of short tone burst, and the duration is given on the abscissa. The level that is necessary for the tone burst to be just audible in basically steady state noise of different levels. The red curve gives a noise of 60 dB, the blue curve is for a noise of only 40 dB. What we can see here is that irrespective of the noise level, the masker, masking increases, or in other words, the energy of the test tone needs to be turned up if the test tone gets shorter than about 200 milliseconds, here indicated by that dashed line. So beyond 200 milliseconds, we kind of have steady state conditions. Shorter than 200 milliseconds, we need to increase the level uh, of the tone. And that increase is done with 10 decibels per decade. That means, in other words, if we go from 200 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds, which is a decade a factor 10 in duration, then we have to raise the level of the signal, the probe signal, by 10 dB. And the same again holds true if we shorten it further to 2 milliseconds. Again, we see here about a 10 dB difference. So, in short, if your signals are shorter than 200 milliseconds, we need to increase their level to compensate for the shorter long-term energy. In other words, you could consider the auditory system as a long-term integrator, an integrator over 200 milliseconds that looks for the energy of the tone to detect the tone in the mask. I've also brought you a demonstration of this effect. Um, there are 10 tones played um, and with shorter and shorter duration. We start off with 500 milliseconds and the duration is shortened in steps all the way down to one millisecond. The demonstration is played first without the noise and then in the second time with the noise. And you can basically count how long and how many tones you can hear in each situation. You can of course hear the tones without the noise, but with the noise present, you will hear something about a seven or so of the tones. So at a very short duration, the tone is basically not audible anymore, uh, which is uh, very interesting. So you need to compensate for audibility by just increasing the level of it. Note, this also means that if you have short impulsive sounds, to hear them and to have for them to have a certain loudness, their level needs to be very high and it can be dangerous. The effect of tone duration already brought us to temporal masking effects. But we can also see masking as a relative timing issue of the tone relative to the masker. So far, we consider simultaneous masking, where the tone or the probe signal is simultaneously present to the masker. But there's also a situation where the probe tone or a short burst is present before a masking sound. And interestingly, there is even masking there. We call this backward masking or pre-masking. So even before the masker is turned on, you have to raise the level of the probe to hear still the probe. That lasts for about 20 milliseconds, can be 50 milliseconds, particularly with hearing impairment, these durations are more. The other masking, which is much more pronounced, is called forward masking. 
So after turning off the masker, it will still continue to mask signals that come later. So a short probe might be masked or their threshold needs to be increased to, uh, for the probe to be audible even out to 200 milliseconds. And that's quite pronounced and this is what we look at in the next graph here. And these are the da uh, data for uh, forward masking. After we turn off the masker, the masker has to be, as we already heard, longer than 200 milliseconds. And uh, measured is here the level of a short tone burst that's necessary to just hear that tone burst or to detect it uh, as a function of uh, the delay time uh, after the mask has been turned off. You see here also the threshold and quiet uh, for that tone burst and because it's very short it's higher than uh, the regular threshold and quiet for tones uh, so we had to measure this. What you see here is that on the logarithmic scale, logarithmic time axis, you see an almost linear decay of masking over time uh, with time after the masker um, lasting out to beyond 100 milliseconds. So in the first one, two, three, five milliseconds, masking is basically unchanged from that of the noise masker and then the decay starts to happen. This brings us to the summary of the second part of uh, psychoacoustic masking. We considered here the simultaneous masking by tones on other tones. We see that similar to noise maskers, masking is most strongly near the masker frequency, so near the tones frequencies. But what we see also very strongly is an upward spread of masking. Masking increases at high frequencies more than proportionally if the masker level is above 50 decibels. We then considered temporal masking effects where we looked into the effect of the duration of the probe and we saw that when the probe duration is shorter than 200 milliseconds we have to raise its level by 10 dB for each shortening by a factor of 10. We found the interesting case that there is backward masking. So in the moment, uh, you have a probe that comes on before a masker. The later coming masker can even mask the probe that was there before, so before the onset of the masker. The more common case is the forward masking. It's more strongly, it's more pronounced, it lasts up to 200 milliseconds. And we see an almost linear decay over a logarithmic scale for forward masking. This brings me to the end of the second part of our psychoacoustic lecture on masking and the next part will now go forward from masking and explain how we can model masking effects by telling you more about auditory frequency selectivity and the critical band concept. Thanks for listening and I hope that you'll enjoy this.